Pandezo Now, can you all hear me? Please raise your hands if you can hear me. I would like to wish all of you who are listening over the webcast. Uh, I hope that I uh, wish you my greetings and wish that you are well. In particular, I would like to wish all of you who are listening over the webcast I'd like to offer uh, special I greetings wish my to greetings the students in the you are well. Shadras and the faculty of the Shadras. So this is the beginning of the uh, common year 2022. And so I'd like to wish everyone in this new year that you all be healthy. And I wish that all of you may be able to accomplish all of the wishes and aims you have in your minds in accord with the Dharma. Now, because of the pandemic, we are unable to hold our Kaju Gunshu winter teachings in Bodhgaya as we normally do. But all the shadows are actually um, holding the events at the same time and continuing to maintain all of the schedule as it is normally done. And so we are in the midst of this event. And so in addition to that, if I would, and there are many who have expressed the opinion that it would be good for me to also give a teaching And so, and just so that I don't disappoint you and disappoint your hopes, uh, we have uh, organized this teaching together. Now, the students for whom this uh, teaching is specifically for is the Sangha members and the various Shadras. And I thought that uh, there would be more of a connection and be more appropriate if I taught about philosophy instead of practice. And so I have chosen a more philosophical topic. Uh, as you all know, we usually consider that there are the Great Exposition, Sutra School, Mind Only, and the Middle Way are these four major Buddhist philosophical schools. And if we think about among all of them, if we talk about the topic of the Great Exposition, then this is explained fairly clearly in the Treasury of Abhidharma. So most of us, most of our students, have a good degree of familiarity with it. If we think about the sutra school, though, uh, there are actually very few actual sutra school texts. And so since this is the situation, 
Hezir Hezir uh, there are only some passages in the texts on epistemology that are similar to the sutra schools, but there is no extensive presentation of the sutra schools. Now, with the middle way, all of the Tibetan schools say that everyone says, that's me, that's them. Everyone says they're, they're middle way. So I think that most of us really have a great deal of familiarity with the uh, topic of the middle way. So how could I have anything? I could hardly have anything to say that you don't already know or understand. But if we think about the mind-only school, Generally in Tibet, there is almost no one who holds the mind-only mind only philosophy. And there was never any develop of an independent mind-only school. Even when we think about the Indian mind-only texts that were translated into Tibetan, there were these texts were... Uh, either stretched and pulled to fit into the middle way uh, by the various scholars. And so it's like there are many there sort of uh, stretched in all different directions in order to fit the middle way. And so it has become difficult for us to actually identify what is the uh, mind only. And there are also very few people who present actual, uh, uh, have done independent research onto this topic, and there are few actually self-standing explanations of it. It's really difficult to be decisive about what actually it is. Now, on the, in the international arena, there are many scholars who research and discuss the mind-only philosophy. But we have literal familiarity with that, with them and the topic. So I think that even to this day, the topic of the Middle Way is like a big uh, missing area, a big blank area for all of us. And so I thought if I were to speak about it, there would be, um, th there'd be nothing inappropriate about saying something about the mind only. Now, for myself personally, one thing that has worked out for me in this life is I've had the good fortune to be able to study several other languages a little bit other than just Tibetan. And among them, I know some Chinese, I know it a little bit better. And when I say that, that means that I... I reached the level of sixth grade education in Chinese. And so it's not really a particularly high level. And the reason for that is that when I was studying Chinese when I was young, I studied until the age of, uh, uh, until I got to the sixth class, and then I uh, took a break from those studies. And then when I went to India, and when I was in India, I had no opportunity to continue with it. And so basically, once I got to the sixth class, I then it stopped it at that point. So I only have a, very, a relatively low primary school education in Chinese. But I have taken, uh, taken interest in Chinese. I've taken interest in the Chinese language and studied it. And because of this, Uh, I've had been a little bit of an opportunity to kind of dive into the ocean of knowledge in the Chinese uh, Buddhist canon primarily. Now, I had many uh, teachings, teachers of Chinese when I was little. And if I, uh, and if I were to say all their names, I would 
It wouldn't be right. Some of them I remember the names better than others. And if I'd leave someone out, it wouldn't be okay. But when I was young, I had many different teachers, and most of them were Tibetan. But I did have one uh, Chinese uh, student, uh, Chinese teacher, and he was quite old. I think he was in his 70s or 80s. I don't think he, he probably is not alive any longer. Now, at that time, when they came to teach me Chinese, I didn't study well. I always thought to myself that I had people saying to me that studying Chinese is not so good. And people basically said that the, the intent for teaching me Chinese was actually a bad intent. So basically, so at first I was a little bit uh, so I was a little bit lazy. In addition to that, the people around me were criticizing it, so I did not study Chinese well. And so actually, I'm a little bit, I regret this a bit, but the little bit of Chinese that I do know is because of the kindness of those teachers. So I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to appreciate them and to express my gratitude and thanks. In any case, because I do speak a little bit of Chinese in the last few years, I have had the opportunity to read more than a few articles by the uh, many international scholars from Asia and the West who research Buddhist history and philosophy. And because of this, I see that from one perspective, this has increased my knowledge and has opened my eyes and been very beneficial. Not only that, I see that within our within Tibetan Buddhism, that contemporary research is extremely important. And this is an area that we have been left far behind. And so this is how I've felt about it. So for these reasons, if I was able to, if I could be able to tell you uh, uh, what I have learned, I thought it might be uh, somewhat beneficial. This has been my hope. And this is what gives me the courage to speak about this. Now, as I said before, in general, we speak about there being four major schools in Buddhism, but the reason why I'd like to speak in particular about the mind-only school in particular is that in Buddhism, in general, we primarily have the teachings of the listeners or in the bodhisattvas, where you can talk about it as the foundation vehicle in the Mahayana. This is as is well known. Now, if you want to understand the philosophy of the listeners or shravakas, then you absolutely must know the great exposition and sutra schools. Now, if you want to know Mahayana philosophy, then it's you absolutely must understand the middle way and mind only. And between these two, according to the Feast uh, for Scholars by Paozula uh, Chengwa, at the time when Chandrakirti was at the Nalanda University, he was the only middle way scholar and all of the other scholars were mind only. And so this is what it is said. And so when we look at this, If we look, compare the middle way and the mind only in India, we can think that the mind only was probably more widespread. And so that is the way it seems. I lost a little bit there. Excuse me about that. So if we look at the between the middle way and the mind only, 
it seems that first the Prajna Paramita Sutra spread and that the mind-only sutras, such as travel to Stalank and so forth, were a little bit later. Also, if we think about it in terms of masters, Nagarjuna was earlier and Master Sangha and his disciples were later. So thus we can say that the middle way spread earlier and the mind only spread later. So this is in terms of the order in which they spread. However, the middle way philosophy did not entirely satisfy a Sangha and his disciples. And so that is why they uh, began to teach and develop a new philosophy. And when the later great middle way masters, such as Bhava Viveka and uh, Chandrakirti, established the middle way view, their main opponent was the mind only. When they refuted other uh, realist Buddhist schools, they only gave a few stanzas of refutation. But when they uh, refuted the mind only, their refutations were very long. Likewise, it's also because of the mind, masters of the mind only school that uh, the Buddhist teachings on logic and epistemology spread widely. widely. And this uh, Buddhist uh, epistemology not only influenced Buddhism, it also exerted a strong influence on the Hindu and the Jain and the other Indian religions and philosophy. It had a very strong, it was very influential. And in Tibet, we consider epistemology to be extremely very important. And we have a lot of discussion about is it mind, mind only or middle way. Likewise, in the, with, when we talk about the, uh, the subdivisions of the middle way, there are the two schools, the consequentialists and the autonomous middle way schools. And that difference arose from what, uh, whether Bhava Viveka using autonomous reasons and Chandrakirti not using autonomous reasons. And so this is the development. And so when, uh, when Chandrakirti criticized Bhava Viveka saying, wishing to show himself to be learned in intellectual treatises, he was criticizing Bhavaki. And this could be, it was understood as saying that is because um, Bhava Viveka was following the systems of logic developed by Dignaga and uh, Chandrakirti was saying there are many different faults that occurred for him. And so for this reason, it's likely, this is why it's said that Bhava Viveka used later epistemology and logic and Chandrakirti used the earlier epistemology and logic. And I think this is, these are very closely linked. And, and later, there's uh, also the story of, in the Chinese uh, tradition, this, uh, of uh, debates between Bhava Viveka and other middle way masters. And I will speak about this later. In any case, the idea of, uh, of distinguishing between the autonomous and the consequentialist school is related to the issue of how, how closely they are linked to the middle way school to the mind-only school. Now, likewise, a yoga child and middle way proponents, uh, such as Shantarakchita, explain the ultimate truth according to the middle way and the relative truth according to the mind only. And so in this way, we can say that uh, they're called the middle, the yoga child and middle way. That, and so this we can say that instead of the middle way influencing the mind only, it was like it was as if the mind only had a greater influence on the mind uh, middle way, and so when we look back at it uh, at, at the history from a later perspective, we can we can see it in this way. Now there is a, a tradition of dividing the Mahasayana Sutras into the first, second, and third wheels of Dharma. 
Now, in the second and third wheels of Dharma, there are a great number of sutras. There are quite a few in the second wheel and quite a few in the third wheel of sutras. But in particular, there are sutras like the, the Avatamsaka Sutra, which are really long and very well submitted in sutras. But these are mainly sutras that are used by the mind only as their sources. I think that there, it's, there are probably more sutras used as sources for the mind only than there are used as sources for the middle way. And so if we want to gain a good understanding of these uh, sutras, such as the Avantamsaka Sutra, it's important for us to base ourselves and to read the works written by the mind-only scholars. And it's not just the sutras. In terms of the mantra, the ultimate view of the secret mantra is, is said to be the middle way. Now, even if we consider it to be a middle way, within uh, there is a great influence on the yoga tantra from the mind-only philosophy that many scholars of the past have, as many scholars of the past have described. Likewise, the determination that appearances of mind and so forth are also really emphasized in the unexcelled Yoga Tantra. And this is very clearly explained in the Mahamudra teachings. And so for that reason, gaining a good understanding of the mind only is extremely important, not only for study of the sutras, but also for studying and practicing Buddhist chantras. It's very important and very beneficial for this. And not only that, um, many, several authors of famous character commentaries on the tantras, including Bhavya Kirti and Bhavabhadra, are known to have hold mind-only views. And so, for this reason, when you think about it in a Dharma perspective, the, it's a really crucial point that we need to study and understand the mind, uh, mind only school well. Now, if we think about it in terms of the world or the general situation of the world, it's also a very important point for us to study the mind only. Now, the reason for this is that uh, in the past in Europe, there was the Renaissance. And so this is a period in European history. And during this period of the Renaissance, uh, before that, there had been the medieval age And at, during that time, they considered the uh, the traditional views of the world and the Stratelian philosophy to be extremely important. And, but at, during the time of the Renaissance, the Europeans were like kind of released from the confines of medieval philosophy. It's like they were able to develop a new uh, way of a new of things. And so, they instead of saying that the world was created by a, a god they said that there is like a the nature and there is a, a humans and so like there is actually an opposition between humans and me's so there are humans and there is this nature that was other than humans and when they began to identify in that way and so they began to think so how can humans take control over nature the god was no longer so important so, uh, so people thought that because they were more powerful, they could take control over nature. And so in order to, um, because they wanted to take control over nature, there are great developments in the natural sciences. However, one bad, th bad thing that occurred from this is like there's a lot of environmental destruction and air pollution and so and many other difficulties that we still face to this day. 
And so this and this continues makes a danger for whether we humans and other living beings will be able to continue living on this earth. And so this is still occurring this day. And this the reason this is happening now is because of the great increase in the study of the natural uh, and sciences and then the destruction that that led to. That is why this has occurred, right? But if we were to take the mind-only view as like the basis, we and, the nat and nature are not opponents. We're not separate. And the reason for this is that the natural environment is created by our mind or is an appearance of our mind. And so for that reason, the natural world is like a part of us. It's not something that's completely separate, like the two horns on a cow. However, the views of materialists and the natural scientists have a really strong influence on contemporary society. So for that reason, most people these days regard the mind only and other views that emphasize the mind as primary as being like pointless. And they think it's like meaningless when they hear it for it. And when you discuss with other people about it, they say, oh, that's that doesn't mean it. It's like they start laughing about it. This is mainly because when we are little, from the time that we're little, we study science. And we study science from the time we're little. And then and the, the, there's a really strong imprint of the materialist views on our beings. And so within the society, overall society, there's this general view. And because we, in this influence of this larger society that's influenced by the materialists, we think that the materialist view, of course it's true, we think. And we never even begin to question or to doubt it. And so there are even fewer who really consider that the idea that the mind is the most important thing. And so the, and there are even far fewer who actually believe the ideas that the mind is the most important, the mind is primary. And so for this is some time when our people, our contemporary society is moving even further, further in the direction of external things and people have an even stronger interest in them. So we have more interest in a, a stronger interest in external things. And there is a great, even greater and greater material development. And so in an environment like this, There's basically no one who questions or doubts materialist philosophy. Now, to explain it from another angle, the, these uh, ideas that think of thinking of the mind as being the most important thing that are actually extremely important. They've been with us from ancient times to the present, and they're an important, extremely important part of the philosophy of logic and thought. In particular, there were many people who believed that the mind is the most important. And so in our current day, in terms of the Dharma, we talk about this, the age of the five degenerations. It's an, an area where we have wrong ideas of what is good, bad, wrong beliefs about what we should do or what we should not do. And so in an environment like this, it is very important for us to study the middle way of mind-only philosophy. And the real reason for this is, this is that not only does this increase our knowledge, it gives us actually really critical, uh, you know, to, to use, a, to, use a, uh, to use an idiom for it, it's like it really hits the mark in giving us um, something that can benefit us and help us. 
it's something that can actually change our ways of thinking and And it's the way we think about the world and what we consider to be valuable. And the way we think of the essence of our human life, uh, all can be changed by studying mind-only philosophy. And so for that reason, uh, it's a way that can actually give us a new, new way of thinking. So in this contemporary age, studying the mind-only philosophy is extremely important and a very practical benefit. But one thing we need to think about is that our contemporary society is like, it's a technological age. It's like an age when uh, when things are done by technology and people don't have so, as much to do. And likewise, it is also an information age. There's all the uh, social media and the internet because of this, we're in, a, in an information age. So it's like we are on a kettle of boiling water on a stove. When a, like when water is boiling on a stove, it doesn't stop for an even instant. It just continually boils. Likewise, our life is going. It's, and so we get tired, but the technology never does. And so we're always getting new new things in every moment. And it's like we have no time to relax and uh, relax and just uh, relax and rest. It's like we're the the bubble of the boiling water on the stove. And so when we're in that sort of a situation, what happens to us in our own situations is that is that we've like have no control of what we're going to do. It's like all these external conditions. It's like when we have like, this is what we have, they have abroad. They have like puppets made out of wood and there are marionettes that are hung from strings. When you pull the strings, then the puppets move up and down, right? Now the puppet is not actually moving, but it's mainly the puppeteer who is moving it. And so the puppets move. And so it's like that. And so we're like that. We have no control ourselves. We have to stay under the uh, influence of external things and the pressure and the control of extra things. Even when we focus our minds, we direct our minds primarily outward to external things and orders. So, so at one level, it looks like we're really, uh, everything is really good, but actually we're under the control and pressure from external things. Now, when we do focus our minds and think, where is it that we think? We don't look inside ourselves. Mainly, we only look outside. We look at the various external things. And we look at different people, different individuals, and we think about them. We look outward towards them. We don't turn our minds to our own mind. And there are fewer and fewer who are actually looking inside in our minds is getting further and further away from us. And so for this reason, when we think about, you know, are we humans? In the old days, humans, in the day when there weren't as many humans as there are now, I feel like if you're a no, nomad, you would like your own sort of independent existence or you couldn't, you had to be able to live on your own without relying too much on other people. But the more that it, external material development has happened, we're no longer in like an autonomous ex or independent existence. Now we're like cogs in this larger, organ huge organization. And so uh, like we're like small parts of a larger thing. And so for that reason, people, It's like that we're getting further and further from ourselves. Like if we think about Tibetans, for example, people have left their homeland. 
And people's uh, origins, like our language and our culture, are things that we forget, that we gradually forget. And the very instance was like we're like losing track of our own mind, and we're no longer able to recognize who we are. And that's the situation that we have come to. And so, in this way, this is the biggest problem that we have in our contemporary society. It's the fact that we are separated from the natural world. And we have don't have a lot of uh, uh, consideration for our families and friends. And we have no separated from our uh, neighbors and we're separated from everything and we're feeling alienated from everything. And because we have this feeling of alienation, what many people think is that this gives us like a mental illness. It's like it. It's like a poison that gets into our mind that gives us many mental illnesses. Now, most of these mental illnesses probably can be helped by by medical advance, but they shouldn't be. They aren't entirely cured by medical practices. It's something that the patients themselves need to make efforts on their own initiative to, to try hard to see what is going to work, what is going to improve themselves. That's the way it should be. But if we think about the way contemporary people are, it's very difficult for us to take the initiative and actually make the efforts to improve ourselves. And the reason is that at the beginning, we don't recognize who we are and if we say, well, you have to make efforts to improve yourself, then we don't understand what we're supposed to do. It's because we don't know who we actually are. And so if you say that you have to take initiative and change yourself, then it's like we don't know how to think about it. So that's the situation that we're in. And so for this reason, when we look at the mind-only thought, and think about how the mind only appeared. And when you examine this, then we could say that the origin of the mind only school is that it arose as an investigation into the world of our human mind. And in particular, in particular, what the mind only uh, has done is that the mind only examines in great detail what the nature of the of the natural human mind is, and they look to see what is the capacity and what is the functions or uses of the human mind. And so they have given a really and so they give a really fine analysis of like the presence of the ground consciousness and afflicted mind, and of how the various consciousnesses exist in a mutual relation of cause and effect with each exerting an influence on the others. And for this reason, the mind-only philosophy is like a complete system of psychology. And if we compare it with Western psychology, we'd say that it's that the mind-only uh, uh, psychology is not, not, if it's not better than Western uh, psychology, it is at least not worst. And so this is in particular, it's not only in, academic uh, description of psychology that speaks only of yeah. <laughs> So, so the the middle way philosophy is uh, something that's not only it's a academic description; it's a philosophy that has practical benefit in actuality and real capacity to help people heal. And so the reason is that the mind only isn't mainly only to just speak about things, but the aim of the mind only 
is to like to to cleanse the 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 polluted or the uh, stained aspects of our mind and to correct all the erroneous aspects of our minds. And since that is the aim of the middle way, the mindly school is therefore not only a an academic discipline that only talks about things in terms of reason and reason and logic. And so for this reason, the mind-only philosophy is not just a, a science or a, an area of knowledge that earlier generations have left for us. It is also something that is a very beneficial and very useful in our current day. It's a real living system. Uh, uh, it's a very uh, vivacious uh, uh, view and understanding and religion. And it also has uh, uh, applications in the medical field. Now, within the mind-only literature, there are, of course, many passages that conflict with science or that emphasize religion, faith, and devotion. You cannot say that everything matches science exactly. And there are many parts that are primarily religious and, and talk of faith and so forth. But, but e even so, they're really very important. And the reason is that we, within our daily human life, there are many experiences that we have, many situations we have. And if we ask, is science alone able to deal with our situations, able to remove all of our difficulties? We'd say, no, it's not. If we look at uh, our human, uh, the, the human history, we'd see many, much of the, what has given us courage and the ability to live has comes not from science, but from other things than science. For example, like with mind only, it is a, it is a Buddhist school, it's a Buddhist philosophy, and its aim is that it is uh, for those who wish to free themselves from suffering. And if we look at the, the courage of such people and their capacities, then this is something that can really give us a, a new meaning and a new courage uh, to face our our uh, our human life. So the mind only not only has a psychological presentation that accords with science, but the mind only also is a philosophy related to the Buddhist religion, and so for that reason, it has. There are many people who offer, uh, there's a lot of presentation about religion in the mind. And these are also necessary for us. And this is because uh, science alone cannot eliminate all of the difficulties that we face in our daily life. So these days, many people think that, uh, think that, the, that science is like an all-powerful king that can remove all of our difficulties. But when we meet actual difficulties, there is a lot of uh, power and courage that comes from other things than science and other philosophies. And they are, these are very beneficial for us. And so the fact that this uh, mind-only philosophy that is so beneficial and so powerful for us is still alive is really something extremely uh, uh, fortunate for all of us. However, these days there are a lot of people who uh, really in, like mind-only philosophy who take a lot, um, take a lot of interest in it. And like in terms of Buddhism, it's a, it is a religion that considers the mind to be the most important. And so, for that reason, that for anyone who's studying or taking interest in Buddhism, in Buddhism. We need to have like a, 
if we have both a, a, an appropriate traditional and contemporary education, how the mind and mental factors work, then that's really benef uh, um, beneficial for us. And if we want to understand the present Buddhist presentation of the mind and mental factors, then uh, we really crucial for us to understand the mind-only philosophy. If we understand the uh, mind-only philosophy, then it's needless to say that we will have a good understanding of the mind and mental factors. Uh, so now from the, in ancient India, when the mind only was spreading there, the famous Buddhist institutes of study, such as Nalanda and so forth, were centers for both middle way and mind only. And so at the time of Naropa and other masters, there were many great masters such as Shantipa and Suvarnadripa. So, but certainly Suvarnadripa might not have been at Nalanda, but Shantipa was certainly an undisputed master of the mind only who was at Nalanda. So basically, the Indian Mahayana Buddhist centers of learning were places where the middle way and mind only coexisted. And this was extremely beneficial for making the Mahayana teachings flourish. It didn't cause any harm at all. Our teacher, the Bhagavan Buddha himself, respected the different, we could say, respected the different faculties and capacities of interests of his students, students as they were. He considered them important. And he taught different types of dharma that matched our different faculties, capacities, and interests. And so because of this, there were the different vehicles and philosophies to flourish, a could flourish. The primary reason and condition for the different vehicles and philosophies to flourish and improve it's because the Buddha taught the uh, Dharma differently for people with different faculties and capacities. And so that is the main reason why there are so many different vehicles and philosophies. But our situation is a little bit different. In Tibetan, we say the heavens are middle way, the earth is middle way, I'm middle way, they're middle way. We say everything's middle way, and everything's only the middle way. And since this is what we say, it's like we kind of look down a bit on the lower philosophies and we ignore them. I say, oh, they're realist schools, bad views, and they've, uh, they are wrong views compared to Nagarjuna's, to Nagarjuna's. And so we look down on them too much. We ignore them too much. And in many, diff in many respects, We have to think, has this helped us more or has it harmed us more? It's hard to say. In particular, in terms of us being middle way proponents, in order to understand what we ourselves are, we can only understand it based on our knowledge of others, of who others are. And so for that reason, if we understand how it is that we are middle way, we need to understand what is the mindly, mind only and what the mind only is like. And if it's not, if we do not, and the mind only is only an opponent presented in middle way texts, and we think, ah, oh, it's nothing, and we don't value the mind only if we don't give it any value then it will be difficult for us to understand what are the particular features and qualities of the mind only, because we're thinking the mind only is not important. Because now that we've devalued the mind only, we can't really understand what its particular features and qualities are. For example, in, uh, in our contemporary society, in the great cities, you know, such as New York and other great large cities, there are people of many different ethnic groups. And if we're someone who doesn't really like Tibetans, you know, the, big, for, the first of all, if they don't value uh, Tibetans, then they won't take any interest in what the futures of, of, of Tibetans are, understand it. They won't be able to understand it all. 
because at the very beginning, the way they're looking at them is is uh, is wrong. And so because of that, it's difficult for them to learn anything about what the particular you know qualities and and features of Tibetans are. And so because we have made the mind only into the opponent in the middle way uh, texts, and so for the one perspective, we say that it's a uh, it's a bad philosophy. And we think to ourselves that Nagarjuna completely finished off the middle way school, totally defeated them. And so it's like this blocks the door to beginning to investigate what are the particular qualities and features of the mind-only school. Now, to look at it from one angle in terms of Buddhist teachings in general and within the monks and nuns and kajushetas in particular, I so basically say that if we were to say that uh, we have very little knowledge of the mind only, that would not be an overstatement. And the main reason for this is that even the great Tibetan scholars, have like conflicting explanations of who the great scholars of the mind only are and what their texts are. It's like we say, well, who is, is this a master, a uh, mind only master? Not some will say they are, and some people will say they aren't. And it's saying like, if we have a text, some will say, oh, this is a mind only text. This is a middle way text. And then, and so for that reason, we want to know who the, because we have the different descriptions of who are mind only masters and what are the mind only texts. It's really difficult. It's even more difficult to, to actually learn what the actual mind-only philosophy is. And even if you're someone who spent a few decades studying in the Shedras, and if you talk about the, the three characteristics, the presentation of the mind-only on the three characteristics, it's difficult for us to explain it clearly and simply. Now, we always like to talk about which view is higher and which is lower. So which philosophy is higher, which is lower. So we always like to, to rank the views of the different schools. And so we, if we say that the middle way, um, middle way view is the most profound, this is something that, that we, is, we often say. We always say the middle way is the most profound view. Even though it is the most profound view, Uh, even though it's the most profound, it doesn't have as many categorizations and many different difficult points as the mind-only view does. And so, like if we think about the middle way view, if we take a few teachings to understand what the difficult points are and to unravel them, then, then pretty much everything else is fairly easy. It's not that difficult otherwise. But the mind-only view is not like that. There are so many different categories and so many different teachings, and it has such a broad scope that no matter how many texts you read and study, there are still many points and, uh, and passages that you are unable to grasp. So if you talk about it in terms of prof profundity, the middle way is probably more prof uh, profound, but in terms of the scope, the mind only, is extremely vast and has ex many different uh, teachings and categories, categories. So I think that there'd be nothing wrong with saying that. Oh, okay. Oh, so I think we need to take a 30-minute break here. <laughs>